Hey everyone, welcome back to Grid Chat. I am already giggly because we had an incredible race. We're talking about Monza today. And also it's only happened twice, but every time I have Amanda on the podcast, Charles Leclerc wins. Charles Leclerc wins the Grand Prix. So yeah. please welcome back our potential witch, Amanda Golka. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me on. I, thank you for letting me on so I can further yap about motorsports. Um, no, it's funny. My for my event reviews, my my audience likes to call me uh, Moth Manda because <laughs> when I'm there, it's like a it's like a guarantee that something will go wrong because like they're like, oh well, for Amanda's video, something has to go wrong. She needs something to talk about, so something always goes wrong. They've decided that that's my fault because I'm there. So maybe now me coming on Grid Chat means that you know, Charles will win a race weekend. <laughs> I don't know. It's feeling positive for me. I've, I was told recently in our little, in our grid chat group chat, which also, if you're listening and you're not part of the grid chat group chat, you should join in the episode description right now. Anyway, I keep being told that I break curses in Texas when Logan, which we'll get into, won his <laughs> first point due to distressing circumstances, which were actually against my own interests. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was in Miami for Lando's first win. I was in Silverstone for Lewis's first win in, in nearly a thousand days. So. Yeah, I was at Miami as well. And it's funny, I convinced myself that I caused Lando's win as well mm -hmm. because a girl that I had met going into like the, the Dolphin Club or whatever it was called, like where I was sitting uh, for the Miami GP, she, we were struggling to open the door and she was like, wait, who's your driver? And I was like, Lando. And she pulls out this like papaya colored like uh like bracelet beaded bracelet friendship bracelets which mm -hmm. I love that those have become a whole thing in Formula One that's so fun for me and I, I wore it and it was like just like a Lando with like hearts or something and so I wore it and then he won and then I wore it again last weekend during Zandvoort and I was like <laughs> I was like did Lando <laughs> is it the bracelet <laughs> I don't, clearly you weren't wearing it this week. I will say I, that. That's the thing. I was wearing it. So it was not oh. that. It was not that. I was wearing it this weekend. But also in my own defense, though, I fully predicted, this is not a spoiler, but also a spoiler. I predicted a McLaren clash <laughs> at that first turn. I expected a double DNF. Oh. So I it may have been my own fault. We're going to have so much to talk about when it comes to our little papaya rules. We actually have so much to talk about this week. And you and I are I very like... We're yappers. We're prone to yap. So we'll talk. <laughs> I, But also, I want to make sure we yap about everything because there was yeah. so much going on even before the race started this week. And yeah. I think we should talk about Logan. We need to pour one out for our <sighs> fallen eagle. <laughs> I know. Poor baby bald eagle. I feel like you and I were in the same boat where we were both kind of like, Logan should not have been on the grid this year. I'm assuming... Okay, yeah, because that was my whole thing. I was like, I don't know why we, we renewed him. And I am not an American that needs to see myself as an American represented, especially as a white brunette. There, we're all over the place. You know, I don't need to see myself represented on the grid in that way. Not even that I like naturally like prefer Europeans or anything like that. I'm just like, I especially I am one of those people where I'm like, if you're going to be paid millions of dollars to do a sport, I think you should be good at it. And that is apparently a very hostile thing to say in the F1 fandom, which is very funny. If it makes anyone feel better, I yell at professional baseball players too. My dad has seasons, angel tickets, and I they're right behind the angels dugouts. I do scream at them. I love that they can hear me. Um, it is my favorite thing. So I was of the opinion that Logan should not still have a seat. I don't like how James Bowles in particular handled it, but I knew it was a matter of time. And I'm not one of those people where it's like, well, we should just let him finish out the season because it's like, this is a business. I would have fired half these people already. Um, I would have fired James Vows already, frankly. So we'll see. Okay. Was... <laughs> My thing about it is I didn't think Logan should be renewed, but I thought once they renewed him, they should have tried to actually make it work. That was my issue mm -hmm. with it this year. It was like right from the Oh onset. yeah, they never, they never tried to make it work. I think exactly. they expected he would come back from winter break, a new man, and he was not. With no because help. Why though. would he be? Like, yeah, why, why would he be a new man when you did not foster him in the, right. the break? or outside of the car at all, it seems. My thing about it was it just felt like I genuinely, from the very beginning, was like, well, so then why? Why did you bring him mm -hmm. back? Because at that point, you could have brought Franco up if you wanted to 
bring someone in and try something new and then mm-hmm. only had him on a year. Obviously, you could have like figured out what you wanted to do. Alex's contract was also up this year. Like it just made no sense to sort of put everyone through it. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it was such a dramatic situation. There was really no interest in developing it. So it made no sense to me to, mm-hmm. to bother. And also on top of all of that, the other thing that really does bother me is this week I was like, okay, Logan's out. Franco's in. No one really understands why Franco's in. Then we see the sponsorships come in and you're like, okay, so that's yeah. why Franco's in. Which is fine. I think he had like yeah. a pretty decent debut. And also that's that's what happens in this sport. You bring money, you get you get a seat and that's great. And he didn't mm-hmm. do anything wrong. He's just, he's just a poor guy who's only going to have nine races in Formula One. So like with that, it's all fine. My issue, and I think shocker for this season, I'm going to say that I think Total Wolf put it correctly, which was James gives more information than it's not than is necessary because the decision's already been made and he's coming at it from a strategist strategist point instead of someone who has any sort of PR training mm-hmm. because you come into it and you're like let's just get this out of the way Mick Schumacher is not special and Logan is basically a puppy who needed to be euthanized like that's what those I was like who uh, asked this question I explained <laughs> it to my dad because that's what I love bouncing things off my dad because my dad does not care about F1 at all. He doesn't care about (laughs) cars. He loves Vegas and that is it Mm -hmm. uh, because he's a degenerate gambler. But um, I love, he's a business guy. So I like explaining it to him because then I can like, I'm like, oh, you're unattached to any of these people. This is how it looks like. I loved explaining the cease and desist situation with him with all the F1 fans, Mm -hmm. um, the fan accounts and all these other things. But I was explaining this to him and I was like, you know, the issue with James Vowles is that he's a numbers guy. And the numbers are great, but you need someone to help you interpret them. You have to be able to do that, especially in business, because the numbers, yes, on paper could be very cut and dry, but in execution, in how you respond to it, in public perception of the numbers, that can change things drastically. And then the numbers are irrelevant because you've burned all goodwill. And essentially that's what James Vowles has done, where he was one of the, he came off of the new season of Drive to Survive very well liked because he, you know, spoke softly and was very calm and went on a whole tangent as to what to order for breakfast, as to whether or not it would it would stain his crisp white shirt, which I respect. <laughs> okay. And he had a very cute moment with Alex where he was like, you know, I can see you winning championships one day. And Alex laughs and he says, you laugh, but you have that potential in you. Those mm-hmm. are great little moments. And that really endeared him to a lot of people. But then you have him just keep wanting to talk. It's like, no, you also came, he also came off looking really good from the Christian Horner situation that yes. also endeared him to a lot of people. And so I'm just like, how do you speed run your own like public nuking? It's fascinating. And then he didn't need to, sure, people were going to ask him about Mick. He could have just said, no, you know, he's in, you know, the, he's in the World Endurance Championship. He was not one of our off, he was not one of, he was not on the table. I would right. have just said that, literally yeah. put it off into his team. And then let his team be like, no, we actually never were reached out to. Like, let it then respond in kind or don't respond at all. It's like, well, this that's what we did. Logan, you know, just say, because uh, it was confirmed that they reached out to Colopinto's team before Logan ever even crashed. So him saying, Logan crashed and that was the final straw. It's like, no, you wanted to get rid of him at any moment. I think you wanted a reason because it's been very clear this entire time in the public courting of Carlos. The, the I don't know why he's trying to make it seem like him and Carlos are, uh, you know, doing the dance in the nighttime. I don't know what's going on there. Um, It's really weird. I need him to stop talking. It's weird to Alex. It's weird to Carlos. Carlos is not talking about it at all. Carlos (laughs) loves to not talk about going to Williams. It's fascinating. And then you've got Alex who's just like, what do you mean I, who have been your number one driver for like two years now and currently, what do you mean I need guidance? What do you mean? Like, that's insane. Like, and Alex, of course, won't say anything. Because he knows, I think, after having been booted from Red Bull and then now watching Logan, I think he now thinks he's in a very precarious place, you know, even though he is the point scorer for Williams and he was the favorite or is currently the favorite. I think it's very clear. It's like, no, 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 you're taking a step down. So it's, I need him, I need James to stop talking. I want someone to just be like, I was really hoping the rumors that a lot of the sponsors and the owners of, you know, uh, Williams were like, hey, what's going on? Like, can you guys rein it in? I was really hoping they, because there was a lot of rumors they were upset with him with the the struggle to get the team on lock. And because that's been the whole, you know, the arc for Williams this year was, you know, we have a lot of work to do. We all heard about the Excel spreadsheet and things like that, you know, of how Williams was previously, you know, managing 
you know, um, parts back at the factory and things like that. We saw the issues with the chassis and everything. And so I was hoping that the rumors that they were like frustrated with him were true because then he would rein it in. And apparently he thinks, no, I must be louder. What I worry about with James is that he looks at himself and he thinks that he should be like the same type of reputation as like Total Wolf or Christian Horner or Zach Brown even. Like he wants to have this this mentality of incredible guy turned a team or team like around from nothing and turned them mm -hmm. into a championship winning team. And that's great. But he seems to also believe that he needs to have a completely harsh and mean personality to do that. And the the difference is that I think like Toto became so endeared to fans until this year to totally different conversation, but Toto mm -hmm. became so endeared to fans because he knew how to project, like project cool guy who will be a ruthless business person, but also is thinking forward, has a strong relationship with his drivers. He was defending George on certain things that like most people would not have defended. He had such a tight relationship with Lewis before this year. There was still this energy of like taking care of his own and that's why he's so harsh versus mm -hmm. you look at Christian Horner and you have a very different type of harsh where he's willing to drop anyone out of dime, but willing to drop anyone out of dime to win for one specific driver that he's very close yeah. with. James is like going from the energy of last year when people were very surprised that he re-signed Logan of him saying, you know, everyone deserves a second chance. We invest in our rookies. We invest in our drivers and all these different things. That big thing where they're looking at photos of yes! Logan's few, very few highlights. Like it's they're making a scrapbook together. Like right. they're like it's it's tea together. And it's like this moment was very because this is when you realized that you could be great or whatever the fuck he said. Like yeah. it was so produced. And then it's like, okay, we lost that energy the moment winter break ended. Like right. <laughs> it's like he went to some sort of like, I feel like he hired like a personal PR person who was like, by mm -hmm. the way, actually look at what's really working. It's called being mean. And it's like, yeah. nobody wants to be friends with someone who's just mean. Like if you want to be mean for a reason, sure. But nobody asked you to be Regina George. But also Regina George at least like set fashion trends, okay, before mm -hmm. she got hit by a bus. James Vows is just being mean to be mean. And I don't yeah. get it. <laughs> He's really not even don't. just being, yeah, because it's like the thing with Toto as well is what people don't, I think, realize it's like because of his culture and his background, like, yes, he is a venture capitalist. He is a ruthless businessman and he wants to win. But usually his frustration and anger and passion comes from wanting to be passionate in support of his drivers. Everyone remembers that scene where it's like, or I, I know I keep bringing up Drive to Survive, but that's where I feel like a lot of these people are getting endeared to these team principles. Okay. Yeah. Most of the, most other sports, people only want to complain about the refs or the coaches or the team principles or the owners. Okay. But because of drive to survive, we get endeared to these uh, team principles. And then now we have, you know, the team principal meetings where Zach Brown, who's the CEO of the company, because he wants to pretend that he is in this conversation, even though he's the owner and not the team principal, which is a whole separate issue. But, you know, uh, he, he like, I think everyone remembers the moment where in 2021, when Max drove up on Lewis's helmet and the anger that Toto felt at the fact that if the helmet was, if the the halo wasn't there, if there, there was various things that, like that could have taken off Lewis's head. And Everyone remembers how frustrated and angry and scared that in, like manifested in Toto, I think. And so it's like, and even in Christian Horner, it's like, yes, he wants to win, but he will support Max and even put up with Daniel and want to try and get Daniel back into the seat, even though Daniel himself left Red Bull. You know, Daniel is not performing at a, at a spot. He like, if you are Christian's favorite, you are his favorite. And it's like, it just seems like, like James doesn't even have a favorite. Like even Zach Brown, he would adopt Lando tomorrow if he thought he had the opportunity to do so. Like that would happen. And it's like, James is like, no, let's play chess with my individual drivers. And it's aside from Carlos where it's like, oh yes, we just want Carlos. <laughs> I want Carlos in my motorhome. I want Carlos in my but hotel also room. We'll see tomorrow. Like we'll see next yeah. season. That could turn into exactly the opposite of like it that's mm -hmm. and I think that's the part that's like with James right now that is is pushing people away from Williams. And I guess the other part I want to make clear because I've talked about this on TikTok a little bit and like I, sometimes people misconstrue what I'm saying. 
Mm-hmm. None of the decisions that he are, he is making in terms of drivers are the wrong decisions. Logan yeah. should not be in the seat. Putting yeah. in Franco and taking on this sponsorship money is a good thing for the team. They need the funding. Like putting Carlos in that seat, of course you would get Carlos instead of a, a, a lower level or a rookie driver with yeah, the opportunity. All of these are the right decisions for the business. But the part is like you said earlier, there's a difference between just making numbers-based decisions and then selling those numbers-based decisions to the public, mm-hmm. which is still necessary. And I think yeah. that's the part that's so frustrating with him is it's like, are you a good businessman objectively if you can make the right numbers decisions, but then you can't, nobody wants to watch you make them. Like yeah. who, if you don't, if you lose all of your fans just from, from yeah. being rude, like yeah. what does that help anything? Like there, there is such an easy way for them to have, I don't, I don't think anyone thought Logan should stay. And I think no. if he would have not made those extra steps of just being, I, I think the word he never should have used was cruel. It would have been cruel to keep Logan yeah. in the seat. He is ruining any potential, like basically, oh, he's reached the limit of what he can do in F1. It's like, okay, do you not think that that could affect his job prospects in other series? Do you right. not think that that could affect, like, do you not think that that could lead to some pretty, I, this is already a very intensive sport. And I'm not saying that this is a sport for the week or anything like that. It's like, you can sell the decision, you can sell the decision, whatever, but to actively be talking about it in the way, like you're trying to get people to be like, you're right. You made the right decision. I think that's what he wants. He wants people to be like, James Vowles is a good businessman. James right. Vowles is a great team principal. It's like, you can be a good team principal and make the tough calls, but you have to support the people that are with you at that same time. He yeah. does not need to be talking like this. He does not need to be saying all this. And no. yeah, the word cruel, the word cruel is crazy. Exactly. And also, I think like it's just so simple to go the opposite direction to be like, we should compare this to the fact that we have Kimmy Antonelli also being announced this weekend because we've got Kimmy. Everybody knew that Kimmy Antonelli was getting that seat. It's no shock or surprise. And the only thing I think that delayed the announcement was Toto wanting this pomp and circumstance of going to Monza, which is Ferrari's home race, having an Italian driver take over in uh, FP1, put in great lap times not crash, which he did, um, and then yeah. give his press conference. Like, I think that's the only reason we had such delay, which again, like from a business perspective, had everything gone exactly the way he wanted, it does look great for him. Okay, my best driver is leaving for Ferrari and in the home city of that team, I'm going to announce the youngest, most promising Italian driver for my team and have his debut be perfect. Like, if Kimmy mm-hmm. hadn't crashed the car, it does fit a great narrative and you can't be mad at Toto for knowing how to do that. Yeah. You can if you want, but I'm just saying no, like if I'm we're not acknowledging. Mad. I'm not, yeah, no, I'm not mad about Kimmy crashing or anything like that. I had a lot of people in my chat because we were watching. I, I do stream watch along with the race, so we were all watching. We saw Kimmy crash and I knew when I, like they did the replay of his onboard, I was like, he's going to go in the Parabolica. And it's like, that's one of those things where it's like the confidence is, I would say, 75% of a good driver, okay? Just being able to strap yourself inside one of these rocket ships and have the confidence to know that you can do that and keep the beast locked down, I mm-hmm. think is a large part of being successful in Formula One. That was my issue with Logan, a lot of it, but I was, I was like, I don't think he sees himself as an F1 driver. I think he's like, I want to be one. It's like, you're in the seat. I need you to act accordingly. Like, And Kimmy is doing that, but Kimmy has also been fostered by Mercedes in the way that Williams did not foster Logan before he got brought up from the driver's academy and all that. But there's something that comes with knowledge of the car, knowledge of the sport, knowledge of a new track. And that is you can't take it 100%. Sure, you may want that fastest time, but this is a repaved track, a, a resurfaced track. Everyone else is going slow, including the guy whose car you're in, He like his, your teammate, <laughs> your temporary teammate is going slower. There might be a reason for that. You know, so I didn't think it was Kimmy's not ready. I thought it as this is his, I don't want to say immaturity, but like his lack of experience showing because a more experienced driver who has been through the system a little bit longer, like maybe even just a driver's academy, et cetera, would know I should be slower so I can know the limits of the car. Forget yourself. The car is something you also have to think of at the same time. And they all ended up having issues on the parabolica for, throughout practices. That's where I think the safety car went off and the same was like yeah, at the end of the, the same parabolica. Position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And it's like the to think, okay, this is where the safety car went off. I need to be careful because something's the safety car who's going a third <laughs> of my speed 
went off. I need to think about that. Like that's something that I think comes with experience as a driver that I just don't think Kimmy has yet. And so it doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be bad. Maybe this is him thinking, okay, I need to like reframe things. If he cannot respond in kind, he could do amazing next year. They're, they're starting, uh, they're doing testing and then they're starting in uh, Australia next year. Mm-hmm. Like could be amazing gonna be great okay but i mean i'm sorry i still love george's face because you could see the moment (laughs) where he was actively trying not to react because i know toto said if he crashes do not not react yep would the car will be fine you will still participate everything will be fine and you can just see the moment where he's like fuck me (laughs) (laughs) like it's you see his jaw tick and i was like oh he's he is so he's so frustrated he because like i know that feeling of like you're not that mad, but you want to react, but you can't. Yes. That feeling is a new level of frustration and you can <laughs> see George going through it. It's so funny. Yeah, I think, th- well, and I agree actually, like I want to go back to what you were saying about him being young and needing to adjust. I mm-hmm. think with with Kimmy, what's unfortunate is that he is coming in under an extreme amount of pressure that he shouldn't necessarily have to debut under. And I think mm-hmm. that's the hard part for him. And I do think one year of separation from Lewis leaving the seat to Kimmy taking the seat would help that problem. But obviously that's not the direction that they're going and that's fine. The other big thing though about this weekend and this free practice that I don't know a lot of people know and if, if you don't follow the technical side of it, which Lewis actually talked about, um, because I think Lewis is trying to kind of help soften that blow that Kimmy's going to get regardless of like taking Lewis's seat and and trying to live up to that name, which is just unfair for an 18 year old to have to do. But but he was talking this weekend about like, you know, what advice he gave Kimmy walking into the free practice and, and how to handle it. And he also said he's been running all of his practices on a previous car. So Kimmy is not, this was the first time Kimmy had this exact setup of the car. And the way Lewis phrased it was like, it's such a better car. You're going to have so much fun. But obviously Kimmy is not set up to this vehicle. Is that He's not set up to this ex- exact setup, these upgrades and all these different things. So he's pushing harder based off of he's comfortable in a previous build of this current car. And instead is is realizing like oh okay I the balance is slightly different or this or that so to be totally fair to Kimmy I think he was told to push because if you look at the narrative that they want they want this fast 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 lap they time. want another max they exactly. want this is this is their redo for losing out on max that's this is which is not fair to put on Kimmy whatsoever and I'm really glad that he's not like let's say something happens knocking on wood to like Lewis or George this time of year uh, and if Kimmy is there, they may put him in this car for a Grand Prix. And if he does not outperform at least Ollie Behrman this season, then I don't know what that's going to look like because you have to look at the fact that Max won his first Grand Prix that he was in with Red Bull, you know? And I think that, and then you're also, again, Lewis Hamilton, certified GOAT, you know? It's, it's, <laughs> it's big shoes to fill. And we've seen that, like we've seen other drivers crumple under that pressure. Yeah. And I, I, I do hope I was telling someone I was trying to put my finger on what it was about Kimmy that felt familiar. And he genuinely is reminding me so much of Tom Holland when he re- joined the Avengers. Like it's the exact same energy. He's like, I'm so thrilled to be here. I can't believe everyone's talking to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, my God. No, that's also like, that's like Ollie's, uh, when Ollie did the race and there's mm-hmm. it, like, I think it was a Prima video or something where he's like, I have no friends here. And then everyone comes up and starts saying hi to him, all the other drivers. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, this is an infant. This is an infant. <laughs> like, or even like when, when he did the live stream after announcing that he was going to Haas and he was like, I think my best friend will be my teammate. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> it's like, you oh, just got sweet. announced. Yeah. It's like, that's adorable. You are a child. Yeah. It's like. Oh God. And even then it's like, it's funny when I'm streaming and like someone comes in and they're like, he looks so young or something or like where we're watching uh, the IndyCar race yesterday in Milwaukee and uh, they did an interview with Nolan and Mm -hmm. Nolan's like 1920, I think. And they're like, is he allowed in those cars? I was like, yeah, he is. He is. is. Yeah. I, I think it's, I do think it's, it's really sweet. It'll be interesting because there's going to be a a very young grid next year. So it'll be fun to kind of watch these kids. I just, these kids, literally these children. Um, but 
I do hope that Kimmy and and hopefully he will because I do think he is getting this support right now. I do hope that Kimmy is given grace by Mercedes and the fans. The fans I don't know that he will get grace from, but from mm-hmm. Mercedes I hope he gets the support that he needs. I think we are seeing some of the other drivers, especially Lewis trying to kind of help him through that situation. Mm-hmm. I do worry though in terms of like his relationship with George. Next year both of their contracts are up. So, yeah. Can I give you my George theory? <laughs> yeah, hit me, hit me. I love a George so, theory. So, because I know that Toto has, like, basically all stopped talking about Max, uh, but Aston Martin has decided now that they want Max. So I think if they think that there's a possibility that Max will leave Red Bull, I do think Mercedes would rejoin that conversation. Yeah. And if I'm George and I'm looking at Kimmy, I am thinking I am no longer the future of the sport because George was brought on as a replacement for to for Lewis Hamilton, really, when he was brought on, really. It was like we're training really, a replacement it, yeah, you're training, not ready to leave. Training for when you leave, yeah, basically. Yeah. And so, but now it's like, okay, no, here's the even younger model. <laughs> An actual <laughs> young child. And then also Toto has never hid in the fe- – like there's been times where there's been animosity and he's been frustrated with Max, but he's never really hidden the fact that he felt cheated that Max went to Red Bull and yeah. that he wanted Max. And so if I'm George and I'm I'm – I'm going to be 100% frank with you. I feel like possibly if there is any possibility of Max leaving this year, the thing that Lewis avoided by going to Ferrari and avoiding the rug pull of losing his seat, I could see that happening to George this oh, 100%. year as well. And no, I see so it 100%. Yeah. When Kimmy was announced and everything was going on, I full on was thinking, if I'm George, I'm sliding into Audi's DMs right now. Mm-hmm. I am having something on the back burner. Hey, so Carlos apparently said you had a lot of money, <laughs> like, and, and like, just in case, like what's going on there? <laughs> what's the budget? Yeah. Like, because I would be prepared for the time when Toto comes in and I'm no longer invited to sleepovers. Like I would be preparing for that if I'm George, but George, I think might be, excuse my language, a little too far up his own ass and mm-hmm. might think that he is still, in spite of Kimmy being there, I think he thinks he's stepping in the mantle of Lewis Hamilton. I think that's what he thinks because he already thinks he's better than Lewis. We've seen that the last two years. I think with him, I think with George, I think I agreed that he didn't know that he was at risk until these last couple of races because Mm -hmm. there were rumors that he was talking to Audi um, earlier on. And Mm -hmm. I think that has kind of shifted his relationship with the team because I think when you look at George's kind of relationship to the fans and the way that he's spoken about versus Kimmy, the other mm-hmm. big reason why Kimmy is going to become a bigger part of the, like, you know, the heart of the team is when you look mm-hmm. at what Mercedes is known for, it's Lewis Hamilton. It's accessibility. Mm-hmm. It is fighting for what's right. It is the extra moments that you spend with the fans. There are so many stories of him pulling over on the side of the road because he sees people in Mercedes gear, signing things, taking Mm -hmm. pictures. Like Lewis is the type of person who is known for doing the most possible for people both on and off the track Mm -hmm. on top of being the greatest driver of all time. Mm -hmm. For a very long time, his relationship with Toto made that a Mercedes brand. Now they are losing that and it's becoming, oh, Lewis is the only good thing about Mercedes and Toto actually Mm -hmm. is the worst. And then George, by association, doesn't have that same kind of, you don't see the same amount of effort put into fans. You see these types of moments where, and and that's not necessarily me like shitting on George because I wouldn't say that the rest of the grid is putting in the same amount of time that Lewis is either. I think you see like... Mm -hmm. Charles, actually, I think Ferrari is going to be a great kind of branding moment for them because Charles hits the same kind of moment of of spending that time and and he's been that deified effort. even without yes. like he makes an effort, but he's been deified by Absolutely. you know the by, yeah. yes exactly <laughs> the king the king of Monza right you know and uh, with George as well, it's like there's that one like what was that there's that one meme that still goes around where it's like him on the scooter and he's smiling and someone asks for a picture and he's like oh, you know like yeah. Yeah. It's like, that's, that's what he's synonymous with. And it's like, I don't blame him because we also have a lot of instances, even this year of like, you know, comedy creators following him into the bathroom and filling him in the bathroom. Like, I don't blame other drivers that are younger for blocking themselves off because it's something that I've had to do. And I am not a international race car driver. You right. know, it's, it's, you know, we see this happening with Chapel Roan right now and everything she has talked about and establishing boundaries is something that I think all these drivers do need to do. But it's at the same time, it's like, yeah, then it's hard to compete with someone like, you know, Lewis, who for the last 
decade or so, you know, has been really engaging with fans and was engaging with the fans to the point of getting a cease and desist for right. trying to show the behind the scenes to the fans on social media. Like it's, it's, you're, you're starting from behind really. And so it's yeah. going to be interesting. Yeah. Cause Kimmy's young and excited and he's, and very he's personable. Gen Z. That's the thing yes. is I think, I think that's yes. going to be what, what that is a big part of what George is going to be fighting against to keep his seat. Should there be someone else that could take a secondary Mercedes seat? It's not mm. just talent. It's not just seniority. It's not just Toto being obsessed with Kimmy and this like obsession of him being the next Max Verstappen. It's also the fact that when you put Kimmy next to George, Kimmy's going to be the more likable one. He's going to mm. be the funnier one. He's going to be. I've already called. I've already called him Tom Holland. I barely know the kid. Yeah. I'm like, oh, he, he reminds me of Tom Holland. And honestly, I think he'll the perfect... hit the whip in Nene because someone has a sign that says Kimmy do it the whip. Right. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> like he'll he'll do it because like it's like him and Ollie doing that like glow stick dance thing for Prima, where yeah. someone was like, I bet they didn't even ask them to do this. They just wanted to. Wanted to. Like it's yeah. It's the same thing. It's like these are these are. It's, I'm. This is gonna sound derogatory because I'm 26 and I'm talking about you know, old teenagers, but like they're, they're young boys and they want to have fun while also being race car drivers, which, you know, I think is going to be very interesting to see how that affects it with both of them being on the grid next year. It's like, they're going to be, you know, people are like, oh yeah, like there's always that, there's already like that rookie or I almost sent this to you where it's Jack and then Ollie and then Kimmy looking like suspicious. And then it's, <laughs> uh, it's Fernando with the glasses that say rookie on them. Like I'm ready. <laughs> like it's, it's so funny. And it's like, yeah, that's going to be the discussion. It's not, I don't think George is going to be in that discussion next year. It's going to be, you know, again, it's, he's not the 20, he's, yeah, he's a 2019 rookie, but it's like, we're in 2025, baby. We're moving on. We've had a well, pandemic. It's, it's also <laughs> when you look at like his rookie class, it, he mm -hmm. would probably be the lowest in terms of, not necessarily in terms of skill or in terms of level, but Lando obviously won that battle. And then mm -hmm. Alex won the likability battle. So what does George have other than a Mercedes seat that he might lose? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think I will for just a moment, a moment of silence for how good press would have been if Lewis and Kimmy had been the two Mercedes drivers, because that would have been really fun to watch. It would have been, I think, amazing. It would have been, <laughs> it's, oh God. I just think it would have been really funny because you know all those memes where it's like, uh, having a regular job is weird because why is why are you 22 with a best friend who's 45? Like, what's up, right. Dave? Like, how are you doing? How are the kids? And it's like, it's the same thing where it's like, it's the like the photo of him and Toto where Toto's like has his arm around Kimmy like, oh, it's okay that you crashed. We're fine. Yeah. See, it's it's just George's car. We don't care. Like, that was the meme going around. And it was like, everyone was using that audio where it's like, having a real job is weird. Like, your yeah. best friend's going to be like a 50-year-old team principal. <laughs> like, what's yeah. up, Toto? It's the same thing. It's the, it's the comedy of that. And it's like, you know, the same thing with bring, bringing up Alex and Lando, like mm. Lando is quadrant and, you know, has a much younger, I think I, I'm not going to be like, oh, it's all girls or anything like that. Cause like, I have heard the way that men speak about Lando and yeah. in person, you know, it's, they, that is their son from the neighborhood. Like that is, yeah. that is the, the, the sweet old boy down the block that used to play little league with their kid, you know, like that's, that is how people talk about Lando and you know, he's got quadrant, like he, he is really capitalized on being like the young, fun gamer driver in a sense. And mm -hmm. then you've got Alex who has just been like, oh yes, I make fun little skits for my ads with my girlfriend, you know, my mm -hmm. girlfriend who's a professional golfer and I'm awful at golf, like has really done a really good job of endearing himself to his audience and fan base. It's like, uh, like he's just like, oh yeah, I'm the goofy boyfriend and this is my professional, like we're each yeah. other's wags, like making a joke of that. And then you've got George who like got a boat sponsorship for Monaco and may possibly have made a comment about getting a daily yacht instead of a, a big <laughs> yacht to Alex, you know, and, and things like that. And like, does the, you know, old money style very much trying to be a part of the Mercedes brand in the way that, you know, Lewis was like wanting to be a part of it and support it, but also actively trying to change it. Mm -hmm. George is like, I'm not trying to change anything. This is what I want to be a part of. That I think is, you know, again, he's thinking in his own self-interest, but not in the longevity of how fans engage with him, if that makes sense. I agree. I think the thing about George is that the old money type of that side of what you're talking about, George represents one side of the F1 fan base, which is the mm -hmm. older side of kind of the elitism, the exclusivity of Formula One, the Paddock Club, that type of person. 
but George is great for that type of person. And there's nothing wrong mm-hmm. with having that type of driver. We have that type of driver in other places down, up and down the grid. The problem is that that has to be balanced by someone who brings in the regular fan, the, the young mm-hmm. fan, the cool kind of excited fan. And mm-hmm. I don't know that George needs to be there when you have Toto there. Toto's always going to get going to bring that yeah. explosivity and that kind of space to the team. And George, I don't know. No, no, no. And like, I, I'm sure someone's going to be like, oh my God, Amanda hates George. I don't yeah. hate George. I right. like him better off track than I like him on track because sometimes I find him incredibly whiny on track. Um, and, you know, I don't like how he handled, you know, the disqualification of him being like, I take pride in knowing I was the first to cross line instead of just giving the you know, congrats to Lewis. I, I, yeah. there's, there's little jabs there where it's like, it's always very clear that he thinks he's better than Lewis. And it, I don't want to say, Oh, cause we're going to talk about Oscar and everything here. I'm sure like to be in these cars, to succeed in the sport, you have to think you are capable of winning the world driver's championship. You have to be capable of thinking that you are the best on the grid, but there is also a level of decorum that George, you would think would purport himself to have considering mm-hmm. how his whole demeanor is until it comes down to the wire of when it comes down to, yeah, where's the, the, you know, decorum, where is the sportsmanship? That is when he gets his digs in. And that's something that I'm like, who is talking to you? <laughs> like, I need, I need you to have, I, I am of the opinion that every team and every driver needs a self aware fangirl or fanboy in their pocket. Okay. <laughs> who can just be like, Hey, so, you know, it'd be really cool if you stop talking like that would be really great. Like I am yeah. fully of that opinion. And I, I think Lando currently needs that too. Cause I don't know what's going on with Lando. I also don't know what's going on with last Aston Martin, but if we keep going about this, we will never get to this. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So let's jump into the race. The couple of, couple of moments heading into the, uh, into the race itself. We've got Red Bull continuing to fall down the grid with a 78 quality. And we also have Lewis having an overly disappointing quality, which he also says was his own fault has a very devastating press moment where he says the team deserved better maybe they'll get that next year with Kimmy which made me so sad but I was really (laughs) hoping we were going to maintain the whole year-long two-week notice attitude of of Lewis at the start of the year because he was freaking out journalists with how jovial he was and I was like oh my god this is so fun and then I think I like the joke that it's like he saw Dorian Pan just decimate the other (laughs) girls on the F1 Academy grid and he was like Oh, that's right. I need to lock in. Yeah. And then did well, you know, during qualifying and everything. And so I was hoping that we were going to continue to see that. But it's like we see a lot of ups and downs with him. And, you know, um, if I'm Lewis, I am still very kind of hesitant in my trust in my team because of how Lewis spoke about the race after George initially won before the DSQ came through. And he said, you know, I'm supposed to be able to trust my strategist because Lewis also wanted to do a one stop and they kept bringing him in. And so, again, shenanigans afoot, in my opinion. But, um, you know, if I'm Lewis, I'm like, oh, you know, can I even trust my team currently? Things like that. And then you have instances with Kimmy. It's like, yeah, they do deserve someone who's going to, you know, go full out. And then the qualification, qualifying and everything. And it was just like, I get where he's at. I think we need sports therapists in the F1 paddock because there's been a lot happening lately where I'm like, "Mm, you guys, I need you to have, you know, someone in your corner, you know, who's like, hey, you know, it's great therapy, snack time, a little bit of quiet time, maybe removing myself from social media, something I don't know. Um, and I, I worry about it with, you know, Lewis and obviously after qualifying, um, because with qualifying, what ended up happening, uh, was we got a Lando on pole again and then Oscar right behind him and George and P3. And, you know, it seemed like the entire grid, our top three, you know, of Max, Charles and Lewis were all devastated and people were using that as a meme. It's like, wow, McLaren dominance got everyone depressed. I need this papaya <laughs> team out of here. And it was just like. It's, it's truly, it is interesting to see, but it's also like so many of these teams, McLaren was not in the fight for the top three last year. We knew that, you know, and now I think this is, these are teams that are dominant that thought they were going to be fighting themselves and are now having to deal with a whole new team that they last year, they were barely worried about most of the time. And they all respect Lando. They all like Lando, you know, but it's like, it's like, okay, well, wait, (laughs) my team is supposed to be curb stomping you. What do you mean? (laughs) And so it's more, I think it's less, uh, I think it's, it's questioning your own abilities. It's questioning your team. It's questioning your car. It's questioning what's going on 
if I'm Max, I am frustrated top to bottom. Charles has been frustrated for seemingly five years now, it seems. And, you know, that's why when he resigned his contract and extended it with Ferrari, the question was, is he, has he, you know, self Stockholm syndrome himself. Um, and then Lewis, obviously, you know, there's been very clear instances where it's like, can I trust my own team that I am with for this rest of this year? You know? And yeah, I just, and then McLaren, I, we don't know what's going on there either. McLaren is just self nuking. Which you texted me, you said, who at McLaren is betting against Lando for the World <laughs> Drivers' Championship? Which I, I, for a second, I was like, is she right? Like, is that, <laughs> could that be it? Are we dealing with sports betting shenanigans? Because that would make sense to some capacity. The only other thing that makes sense to me is that they don't care at all about the World Drivers' Championship and they only want to win the constructors. Which makes That's no the sense only to me. Thing. That makes yeah. no sense to me. That's okay. Well, let's get into the race because okay. I. <laughs> Sorry, I just I'm, kept No, no, it's time. It's, let's do it. I'm. <laughs> Am ill, okay? Because we 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 jump in. I was well, I also I for everyone listening was so stressed because I was traveling, so I couldn't watch the race on time for the first time in like ages, and I ended up maintaining a no spoiler free zone. I she literally texted was not me. On my phone. <laughs> she texted me no spoilers. I'm gonna be traveling, and I was like, all right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I literally finished packing my suitcase. I knew all my friends were asleep because they were waking up for the race. And I texted the four people who I knew would spoil it for me, which you were one of them. And I literally was like, do not text me. I just me. get excited. <laughs> <laughs> which is fine because you always assume I'm watching, which I usually am. So yeah. I literally was like, there's no way for me to watch it. So I had to watch it in the airport lounge before my flight from Canada. And I like took forever to get through customs. So I had exactly exactly the right amount of time to be able to watch the race from when I needed Perfect. to get onto my plane. And I literally was sitting in the airport lounge trying not to like scream. And I know someone is sitting like someone's going to be like, oh, I was sitting behind you in the lounge and you just like were cursing up a storm just like under your breath because I was so confused. I just <laughs> genuinely was like, we finally jump off and Lando actually gets a good start from pole, which like mm -hmm. we have been talking about this every week where concert. Mm -hmm. And not every week, but every week that he's on pole, which frequently has been the case lately, it's he can he just cannot get off correctly. And then you mm -hmm. look into this race and you're like, OK, fine. He finally gets a good start. And you're like, OK, we we might have a real fight on our hands for WTC. And then what happens? Oscar jumps this turn, which like watching it, beautiful move, but yeah. also beautiful move against another team someone else maybe yeah like maybe not your teammate who is completely in the fight the onboard was it, i think it was charles or george's onboard and it looks it almost looks more like contact from the back because you yeah. can see i think it's lando jerking back a bit yeah. more and like slamming the brakes and there's been a lot of speculation back and forth of you know uh, the, I, my whole thing at the start with all of this, I'm not mad at Oscar. I'm frustrated with McLaren. Correct. I'm not mad at Lando for backing off. I'm not mad at Lando for, cause Lando in his head is thinking papaya rules. Right. So we got confirmation from Lando. There's more added to it, but basically it's just don't crash. Yeah. No contact. That is papaya rules. It's race, race clean, but you are good to go. Do not crash. Basically do not pull a, you know, Lando and Max trying to, you know, move under breaking okay and so oscar was like i don't think lando will do it i yeah. don't think lando will pull through which i'm not shocked that he thought that because i mean lando all but confirmed that in, yeah. in the post-race press like questions that he had both in the post-race press conference with the three of them and also mm -hmm. with um his own individual ones and he was like maybe against someone else i would have braked later to try to keep the position mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I of didn't course. Want to crash and I, I didn't want to crash. Because of prior rule. He, and also, if I'm Lando as well, it's like, I'm remembering, you know, you're going to need Oscar for the World Drivers' Championship. You can't do it alone. I am thinking back to everything that everyone said after that. Mm -hmm. I am thinking about what Andre Estelle said, where it's like, if you're not going to be a team player. In that moment, Lando made a team player move, which was backing out. Right. And... Oscar was thinking, they said I could race. And, you know, you could go back and forth about whether or not you think that's a good driver, a good race car driver and things like that. The question is, is, you know, would Lewis have bailed out? Would Max have bailed out? Would Fernando Alonso have bailed out? You know, you got to look at, you know. Well, we kind of know the questions. answer to that question, which is no. <laughs> like yeah, on exactly. all three of those it's drivers. Like, yeah. But again, I know the answer is no. And that's the thing where it's like now that's why people are like, yeah, you can be mad at Oscar all you want, but like he proved he's 
better driver, essentially. We're like the better mindset driver. And my whole opinion on Oscar this year and, you know, what I have been saying this whole time is that Oscar and the rest of us were operating under the assumption that Lando was the number one driver. I think all of us were operating under that until it was Budapest. That's right. Yeah. Um, When that was going on and all the comments being made and everything and you need to pull back. That was okay. We we made this agreement. Whoever was going to you know pit first, which McLaren bungled that too. They should have yep. just let Lando go through. Do I also think that Lando should have let Oscar through so that because if he did have the pace, but it sounds like he did, he could have just overtaken uh, Oscar again, and they wouldn't have had anything to complain about. Sure, I'm pretty sure it was a member of Oscar's team. Now I'm uh-huh. not sure. Someone from the McLaren garage <laughs> put out on Twitter that. Uh, it was like the meeting that they had, the Sunday meeting conversation was that mm-hmm. whoever was leading by the last pit stop got to win. Like there was no passing again. There was no racing after the second pit stop. So okay. the thing about that that is just so crazy to me is that's what the problem is. Like what mm-hmm. we're talking about is like there's I don't know. I, and we should talk about what Will Buxton said, because I, it's the only answer mm-hmm. that makes any sense, which is that Will yeah. Buxton believes um, and said this in the post race because everyone was shocked. And honestly, if you watch Will's like discussion in the post race, he genuinely he's was angry. Like, <laughs> he's angry and baffled. I saw him roll his eyes at Zach Brown when Zach Brown said we have two number one drivers after the I race. rolled my eyes like it doesn't make sense. It's. Because my, well, the whole thing, Oster, what I was trying to get to the point was like yeah. after the race of, you know, Hungary, Andrea Stella said that if things, we don't have a number one driver currently, but if things progress and we continue to have these issues, we will enforce a number one driver policy. And so everyone, including Oscar, thought, wait a minute, I have a chance to be the number one driver. Mm-hmm. And he has been fighting accordingly since, which I don't blame him for because I would do the same thing. I was like, wait, I have the chance to be the, t- the I because he has been a team player. For yeah. years, there's many, not sorry, years, the, for, there's multiple races, <laughs> yeah. there's multiple race instances where, you know, he enforced team orders and fell back and let Lando through. Like there's been multiple instances of that. And now they're not doing that. So why would he just give up the place? Yeah. It is all on McLaren and strategy. And I watched your last episode with Ash and it was like, uh, I think Ash said like, they're not fostering Lando as a driver. Mm -hmm. Like the comment that uh, they made where it's like, who do you think we're racing? And it was like, who is in front of you and who's behind you? And the answer is obviously Max or whoever was in front of him at the time. And I took that more as a condescending comment towards Lando where it's like, who exactly are you fighting right now? Because it, which is not helpful either. Both comments are not helpful. But it's like whether you interpret it as like, what do you think is going on right now? Like, let's do a little on on site, like little like brain teaser or it's a hey, what the fuck do you think you're doing? Like either way, neither are helpful. And so I don't know if we need to swap out strategists for Lando or something, but something is weird going on at McLaren. And then now we have this race where from the jump, the moment that it was a McLaren one, two, the first time since 2012. Okay. That we have had this, they said, uh, they're free to race. That's insane. No, that's ridiculous. It's, it's the thing is when you look at the decisions that they're making, the only actually genuinely, the only thing that makes any sense is what Will said, which is that in Lando, Mm -hmm. I mean, in Oscar's contract, it says that he can't be the number two driver unless mathematically it's not possible for him to win the championship, which Mm -hmm. I would argue mathematically right now it's pretty impossible. He's a hundred points behind. Um, yeah. but whatever. But I, I, you know, like I guess mathematically he could win everything and everyone else could DNF, whatever. Mm-hmm. But I <laughs> and Max can just stay at the middle of the grid. He can be a midfield car. Max will never race again, and Oscar can mm-hmm. win the world championship. I just yes. the thing about it that's so frustrating is that I'm like, quite honestly, if tomorrow Lando announced he was breaking his contract and going somewhere else. I'd be like, that makes sense. And hey, I, think I was going to say crazy. he needs to. I'd be sliding into Audi's DMs too because they're being super fucking weird. They're McLaren is being weird. And I, after summer break, I fully was of the opinion because again, Zach Brown was not at the Hungarian GP. Okay, he. Uh, but then you know during summer break he was golfing with Lando again, and I was like, I'm fully expecting, especially after Andrea Stahl's comments, that Zach took Lando out and was like, I want you to not worry about anything. I thought this was a, you know, don't abandon the team golf trip. Okay. You will win the world drivers championship. We will make sure that you will be a champion. You will beat Max. You will beat Oscar. I will make sure of that. And then we have Zach Brown's comments. And now I'm also like, what 
Does anything make sense anymore ever? Is everyone on a new prescription or something? I don't know what's going on. It's none of this makes sense. There is something behind the scenes that we don't know about and that is is heavily affecting the racing and it's driving me bananas because Mm -hmm. on top of it, it's like the other part of it is that by allowing them to do what they did in lap one, by allowing Oscar to, by telling Lindo don't crash and telling Oscar do whatever you want, you yeah. end up in a situation where you lose the race entirely. They've they yeah. there was no reason they shouldn't have had a one two after this race. Like yeah. it uh I don't I don't get it. I literally do not get it. Especially when his sto- like the last couple of races from pole, it's been very clear Lando is an issue with starts. And, you know, even the reaction time wise, Oscar's been beating him on reaction time. And so I I've been trying to figure out with my child, I'm like, how do you even fix that? Like, do you just get in Sims and just keep restarting the race and just try and get your best start reaction time? Is that the best way you can train that other than, you know, doing mock races on at, at you know, testing facilities? Like that's the only thing I can think of. But also I'm like, I would be freaking doing that. If I, if everyone's calling me Lando Norif, if I don't mess up the first turn, of course the first thing I'm gonna be doing is for, you're you're not going to see me on social media. You're going to see me nowhere. I'm going to be keeping my ass in my sim and I'm going to be fixing this, which maybe he could have been doing. And that's why we got a better, you know, start this time. Obviously it didn't happen last time, but, or, you know, like again, who needs a good start? And we see these up and down with Lando with his emotions and things like that. I think the comment he made this weekend was that he doesn't eat on qualifying days and he gets so nervous. He can't eat during a race weekend or yeah. something like that. And I was like, again, we need a sports therapist on site because what do you mean why are we talking about this i get so worried maybe i don't know maybe they fully don't think that he can win he has the 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 but what's weird uh, about that is like he does like i think i think that when you look at lando and you look at the situation the only thing keeping lando from being a great driver i think he's a very good driver right now i think the Mm -hmm. only thing keeping him from being a great driver is his mental capacity right now not mental Mm -hmm. capacity is not the right word it makes it sound some like I think uh, only- no, but uh, I, I get what you're saying. Like his, wherewithal. his mindset. He, yeah. Yes. His wherewithal. He, he is very, um, when he's doing good, he's doing great. When he's doing bad, he's doing awful. Just emotionally. You know, like there's yeah. no, there's no regulation. There's nothing. And to be fair though, like when you really think about it and you look at the situation, like this is not comparing his ability to Lewis, I will say, but this is comparing like the same type of situation. When you look at Lewis at the beginning of this season and last season, mentally it's hard to work against or to feel like you're being worked against by your team Mm -hmm. itself if you look at lewis's emotions when when he's going through lewis is able to drive through those emotions obviously but when you look Mm -hmm. at lewis's emotions at the beginning of this season where he says i don't expect to ever out qualify george for the rest of this season when you're Mm -hmm. when you feel like the people you are supposed to trust while you're driving a car that could kill you you mm-hmm. don't feel like you can trust them. That is going to weigh on anyone when it comes to racing. And when you're being told on the radio in front of ev- the entire world, do you need to be a team player or or there will be consequences? You're being gaslit. You're literally yeah. being gaslit into being like, if you want to win the World Drivers Championship, you're going to need your teammate. You're going to need the team. The team will, there will be problems if you don't let us, if you don't let Oscar pass. Did you hear us? Radio check. Can you hear us? Right. Like, and and since then, I'm sorry, every single radio message that I hear from the pit wall to Lando since feels vaguely condescending. I don't mm-hmm. know what's going on. I don't know if he really just spit in everyone's face by not immediately giving position up, which maybe if he had given position up immediately, they would have been overtaken because uh, Oscar was so far behind. Who knows? Okay. Yeah. But was that enough to just completely nuke all goodwill and be the son of McLaren? Was and, and nuke that on fire. Like, was that it? Sorry, I, nuke on fire. That makes sense. But you get my point. You yeah. get my point. Like, was was it was that the catalyst that burned the house of Norris? Like, well, was that's that the thing really is, like, it? It really, it really does not make sense. And I truly think whether we ever find it out or not, there is something else going on, whether that mm. is a sponsor situation, whether that is like something in in Oscar's contract, whether that's a Mark Webber mm. thing. I don't know. I do know that something is going on because it makes no sense to be- I don't th- know if it is though, because like I said, for the last year and then the first half of this year, I was under the impression, I was admiring Oscar for this because I was like, Oscar's playing the long game. He knows Mm -hmm. Lando is the favorite. He has no problem being the perfect teammate, the perfect second driver, because he knows eventually he can outrank 
Lando. He will eventually outperform him. And we see this in how he spoke. At the start of the year, he went on a podcast and it was like, how great would it be if Lewis won? Someone else said, the, the host said, how great would it be if Lewis won World Drivers oh, Championship yeah. in his last year? <laughs> and Oscar said, no, that's awful. Better A better headline is Oscar Piastri wins World Drivers Champion. He's yeah. always been like that. That's yeah. always been in him. But he has always been, I am playing the long game. I will be the number one driver one day. It's not today. And he has planned accordingly and reacted accordingly while being, you know, the polite cat, Oscar Piastri, whatever the hell the fans want to put on him. Okay. And then now that he has been given the go ahead of, oh, Lando's not the first. Now he is acting accordingly. So that's the only reason why I don't think there's something in the contract because yeah. I think it's been very clear he's been the second driver this whole time. Rookie year or not, even the start of this year, he was doing second driver shenanigans. But I think know? also part of that was because he couldn't keep pace. Like I think I think there have mm-hmm. been moments where like the truth of the matter is that like he has been favored in some situations where Lando has to be like, I am faster. Like I am faster, let me pass him. And I mm-hmm. do think that the issue, I don't, I don't know what it is. I think. All I know, all I know is that I'm watching a team actively throw away an opportunity yeah. to beat Max. And yeah. the, in just this race and Just in hand Hungary, it to Charles. Give Charles the yeah. driver's championship. Just it's it literally, Charles. it's like, well, also, Charles will tell his strategist to be quiet. Lando is clearly not comfortable telling them no right now. And and he, they're not comfortable giving him usable data. And yeah. then even then, you've got Max, who's like, what got frustrated on the radio. He's like, can everyone pay attention back? Right. Then? No one understood until afterwards. And it's like, there was something that I had to do where he put the car into low power mode because they were worried about the car not getting pace. And he's like, can I put it back? And they said, oh, yeah, you can. And it's like, I have no way. I don't, I can't see that data. They can see that data. They, it was on them to tell me when I could put it back into full power mode. And that is on them. And we could have oh, gotten another pace. We could have moved up. We could have right. done something and get more points. I could have kept my gap a little bigger. And that was that's that's Max getting frustrated with his own team because they're also seemingly giving it up because I don't know, maybe Checo's sponsors. The only thing that makes sense is that Checo's sponsor said <laughs> that we will give you a lot of money if you lose the, <laughs> the, the, the constructors championship. That's the only thing that makes sense. We got the Calip- we can see the the trajectory with Calipinto. We can see the the timeline with that. With yeah. Checo, it's a little more like who knows they want to see how he's going to do, you know, it's just a whole yeah. thing. I think that the thing that is keeping Lando from winning is McLaren, but I also think that Lando is keeping himself from winning by not going against McLaren. I mm-hmm. think if he wants when you when you look at like some of the levels of great drivers, you look at Lewis Hamilton versus Nico right? What happened there? The two of them were willing to crash into each other to prove a point until they mm-hmm. were forced to stop. Until Lando they were literally paid for the damage and had to apologize to the factory. Exactly. Like, and so you look at that and what did that breed? Two mm-hmm. world champion drivers are mm-hmm. bred from, from the, the amount of competition wanting to win so badly that your team principal has to force you to pay for damage. That's called mm-hmm. being a winner at all costs. Mm-hmm. I think the problem that Lando is having right now is that Oscar smells weakness. And I do think that that's the issue because Mm -hmm. Oscar's looking at it and he's like, Lando's very willing to be chastised over the radio. He's very Mm -hmm. willing to eventually do what he's told. If Lando had finished that race and took the win from Oscar for the points, what are they going to do? Kick him out of the car? Mm -hmm. He, that's yeah. where he needs to be. He does, and I, and I hate to say it because I was just complaining about James being mean for no reason. But James mm-hmm. isn't a driver. James need like yeah. if you're on if you're on track, there's James no... is not in nearly as much danger as these drivers are. And exactly. That's the thing. And you have to think of your own self interest at the same time. It's like there's that lo- there's that um, press conference clip that I think always makes the rounds on uh, TikTok of Fernando Alonso and Michael Schumacher, where Fernando said. He is a kid. He has kids at home, a wife and kids. I don't. I knew he would pull out. And, you know, I say it in this way where it's like, you know, it sounds stupid to compare like girlfriend versus not having a girlfriend. But like Oscar, just as a person, even though he's younger, seems much more like self-actualized and with it. You know, he's he's got his girlfriend that he's been with for years. He's got his family, you know, he, he, we don't hear from him when there's on a break much of anything. He hides the fact that he's injured. You know, he, he is like, I know who I am. I know how I want to present myself. I know how I am as a driver and I will act accordingly. And Lando seems a little more like he loves being a driver. He loves being all over the place and things like that. But then when that comes down to getting into that winning mindset, it's just a different 
it's just a different mental composition. It just is when you're a little more all over the place. And I think the thing is as well is that Oscar, like even the the clip that Nicole did, uh, his sorry Nicole, like I know her, his mom, <laughs> um, on the the Red Flags podcast, where when he is announced at McLaren, she goes, "Oh yay." oh my God, no Daniel. And he's like, yeah, that's going to be a problem. He still had no problem taking that seat. Lando really wants to be liked. Oscar knows there's going to be opposition. There's going to be like people saying like, excuse my language, shitting on him for fighting Lando in that first corner. He's not worried about people saying that he's a bad teammate in anything right now. Cause he's like, I raced, I did my job. He called, he took a shot at Stroll and said, if I wasn't behind the go-kart, you know, like that is, <laughs> things like that. Like he, he knows who he is because he knows what he needs to do to be in this car. Lando will play it where he's like, oh yeah, Lando no wins. He makes merch of that and things like that. And like shoves that in people's faces, but it's because he wants to be liked and he is well liked, but it's like, there also has to be a part of you. It sounds stupid. There's a, it's a, it's a very influencer mentality that I see. Cause I see the same thing as well across the board where it's like, I see so many content creators and influencers who have never, they weren't comfortable with who they were before they were, you know, getting millions of views and likes and things like that. And so then they are just desperate to maintain that attention and being liked and they, but they're not confident in themselves at all. They just, they aren't. And I'm not to say that, like, I'm not trying to say that Lando isn't confident in himself, but we're kind of being shown that he isn't because he's not willing to battle. I think the thing with Lando is like I bring I bring Michael Jordan up a lot because I think he is a perfect example of someone who knew he was better than everyone else and was not afraid mm-hmm. to say it. And Michael Jordan, our generation has like Space Jam Michael Jordan, so we don't think mm-hmm. about him in the same way. But Michael Jordan was known for being a mean person. Michael mm-hmm. p- punched Steve Kerr in the face during practice one time. He apologized, but it did happen. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> like he he also like he is the type of person who says, give me the ball and get out of the way. There Mm -hmm. is no love lost about Michael. And when you, if you watch the last dance, which I've talked about a lot of times, I think it it really shows you the mentality that you need to be great, which is I just wanted to do the best that I could. And I knew that Mm -hmm. we could. And so people don't like that. People don't want to win as bad as I do or, or as badly as I do. And I think that is what Lando's missing. And if you look at any of the drivers in history in F1 that have done really great things, they have a mentality where they are not afraid to use, first of all, they're not afraid to fight orders on track. But second Mm -hmm. of all, they're not afraid to use press to their advantage, which Lando is. If you look Mm -hmm. at Lando as being fed questions that he could absolutely be utilizing to be pushing things in his own direction in Mm -hmm. the post-race press conference with the three of them, you know, they, they bring up, do, do you feel like we're at the point where the team should be putting all of their focus on it? And he absolutely I, unless someone is like holding his dog hostage at McLaren and is like, if you say anything mean to us, we're gonna really, we're gonna really no, make remember, you regret he it. Have a dog, he doesn't have a dog or a girlfriend. Remember, he might have a dog and life. they stole it from him. And you know what yes. I mean? Like that's the only <laughs> thing I can think of. But like they're like, we'll give you this dog if you're very nice. Um, yeah. I, I don't know what it is that that keeps him other than the fact that it may not be anything more sinister than the fact that he was asked about. You know, they said that he can't. This was a few races back where they said he can't be mean enough to win. Like he can't be ruthless enough to win. And he said, I don't, I don't want to be mean. Like I want to be a nice guy. I don't want to change who I am. I want to be happy. But even that, I think you can be happy, but then also he's taking shots at Lewis. Like you had a fast car seven years ago. Like, well, but that I think, I think, what are we doing? (laughs) it's, (laughs) It's like, he wants to, he wants to be liked by the people around him, but then, you know, he also is like, he wants to be seen, I think, partially as like a really honorable driver in a sense. Like, I don't want to win that way. I don't want to ask for team orders. It's like, it's not about asking for team orders. You bailed out. Yeah. It, it, you because were right of what you it's, were told. Because yes. of what you were told. That's yes. the problem is I don't understand why he won't just say. I bailed out of that turn because I believed, and he half said this, but he won't just commit to it. Like, Lewis has said some stuff in press. And if you want to be honest with, if we all want to be honest with each other, Lewis 
Lewis's press responses for the first half of the season changed the way that they were running that team because it was yeah. getting so bad that they were like very clearly being told, oh, you're you're overly favoring George. You're sabotaging Lewis. There's an email that there goes was out. Th- there was an email that was like, <laughs> hey, they're treating Lewis so horribly. They're going to kill him. Like it's going right. to put him in danger in that car. That's and what that- it took for a shift to happen. And, and where did that shift them. start? <laughs> right. But where did that shift start? That shift started yeah. by Lewis being willing to say, yeah, the team is absolutely screwing me over. I do yeah. not feel good in this in this spot. And that's, you know, that is what it is. Lando needs to do the same thing because he is at this position where he's being asked up front and he's like, you know, it's up to the team. It's not my. And you can see that he's upset and it's affecting the way mm-hmm. that he's driving. If you're told you guys can race, but do not crash. And then your teammate comes up behind you, breaks into a position where any other driver, if it were against your teammate, you would definitely change your position and risk the crash. Mm -hmm. But you don't trust your team to not blame you for the crash. That's Mm -hmm. why you're driving that way. And that's why Oscar's driving that way because as he knows, he has a championship mentality. He has that he Mm -hmm. is willing to sacrifice the team for himself. And that's kind Mm -hmm. of what you have to have. And Lando just does not have that right now. Yeah. And, you know, now that makes me think, okay, so I changed my my theory over what happened over summer break. Okay. Because I do, we know, we know for a fact that they went golfing. Okay. There's photos. But, you know, now I'm thinking that maybe the conversation was, you're going to win the World Drivers Championship, but the, the, the McLaren guys love you. The, the team loves you. The engineers love you. The, everyone at the factory loves you. You just have to keep them happy and they will make sure you win. And so I can understand why he interpreted that as I need to make sure I don't give them any damage. I need to make sure, you know, none of this happens and things like that, because there was also I don't know if this came out recently or if it was a resurfacing interview, but there was an interview of someone from the McLaren garage basically saying like, oh, yeah, no, we Lando's great. He just has to be polite to us. And he's he's gotten us like like he asked about our kids he's gotten family members concert tickets and things like that like he's he's very personable with everyone in the garage and it's like okay i don't know if that was just i think that may have been just a resurfaced interview or something that was said in like in a passing or something like that and that came up now but it's like we also have to think about before his rookie season he was basically an assistant for the mclaren team he was basically an intern and like helping clean signs and bringing, you know, drivers coffee and things like that. And it's like to be in that position where you've come up with them and then it's like, okay, now you are in a competitive car and now you are, you were a good driver in a mid-tier car and now you're a good driver in a great car. How are you going to respond? What type of driver are you going to be? You know, and it's like, okay, cool. Are you comfortable, you know, knowing that these people know you well enough to know that you want to win and that, you know, there's going to be, you know, some scrapes and bruises and dings and along with it on the the pit crew, are you willing to deal with that and the potential animosity of that, that might come with that of them being frustrated with you because, Oh, well, where's our, you know, our little rookie Orlando, where did he go? You know, it's like, well, he, he wants to be a world driver's championship. So he had to grow up, you know, like what, is that the issue where it's just he has just ingrained himself too much with this team? Whereas Oscar, it's like, I've known you guys for two years. Right. What's popping? And also, I nearly got sued for several million dollars at Alpine. Like, <laughs> I know what I'm willing to deal with. Are right. you? You know, it's like, yeah. I, I just think the, the you know, the the polite cat, you know, cats be scheming. And I think that that's what Oscar's doing. And I don't think that, you know, let's say, I, this is a stupid analogy, puppy dog Lando, <laughs> is he capable of doing that? Or is he just ready? Like, like if you kick him, is he going to come ask for food next? You know, because he yeah. oh, you pet me once, you know? Right. Like that sounds so mean as my dog gets up. Hi, Bubba. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's the, I, I really hope that we see him, you know, evolve, you know, because Max is, it, it's so funny because like, I saw a great tweet this morning before we went live or before we started recording where it was someone saying it's funny because I'm a, as a max fan, because we think the driver's championship and the constructor's championship is lost. But then McLaren also seems to think that it's lost. Yeah. So who the heck is going to win it? K mag. Like, like yeah. what is who, like what we can't all be miserable and also all things. like someone has to have faith in our drivers whatsoever, because it's like, sure. If we all, if we're going to put all of our faith into Oscar. Cool. We need to act accordingly. Right. Okay. 
if we're going to put all of our faith in the Lando because that makes the most sense mathematically, let's go back to the mathematics and the statistics, then yes, we need to be doing that now. Now, okay? now. Because otherwise Ferrari is going to do it because Charles is comfortable telling them to shut up right. finally. You know? Right. Ultimately, I think the problem is that they're looking at it and they're saying, okay, Ferrari is good on a couple of tracks. And even Charles has said this. He was like, I really don't think that we should be expecting to be so much better for the rest of the season. And he was like, I think Singapore is suited to the car right now. And I think that's probably mm -hmm. it. So I think in McLaren's mind, they're like, well, we're definitely going to get constructors. Red Bull is continuing to fall. Ferrari can't catch all the way up. And all we have to do is just keep finishing ahead of Red Bull and we'll win the constructors championship. I don't think anywhere in their mind due to whatever is going on between the way that they're dealing with Oscar and Lando, nowhere on their on their mind is, is winning World Drivers' Championship because the issue mm -hmm. with that is if you look at it, and even if you were watching on F1 TV, like, people were, the commentators were losing their minds. They were like, why have yeah. they not swapped the cars? He can't catch Charles, yeah. so they need these points. Like, swap them, yeah. swap them. And it's yeah. between... Um, between this race and between uh, Hungary, there's a 10-point swing that they've given Oscar. There, yeah. You are at a 62-point deficit that you would be at a 52-point def deficit mm -hmm. if you had just committed to winning this championship. And mm -hmm. I don't know if... I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Lando said something that really made everyone sad. Maybe Andrea was like, now you're my enemy. Like, I don't... It could be something as simple as that. My thing about it is I'm like, it's a bad sports move. Whatever the issue is, yeah. whatever they've promised Oscar, whatever they've they've taken away from Lando, whatever, I don't know. But from a sporting perspective, what they are doing is wrong. It just makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And I get it. Lando doesn't want to be handed his win. But I also would say that Lando obviously is is working within what he's being told. And I mm -hmm. I don't know why he's being told that. But again, it's not being handed a win. Max no. has had a 70 point lead. Right. It's like there are people who are like Max would have to drive turn the car into a tractor to drive and fix that lead. And, you know, Checo made a comment this weekend where it's like, oh, the issues I've been having with the car, they're finally affecting Max or something like that. Mm. And that got me thinking, I was like, is Max like not trying anymore. Like is, is Max just actively rebelling now to, so that they definitely lose and they feel that like, it's like, okay, if you don't want to swap out the teammates, if you don't want us to be next to each other, I'll make us next to each other. Like mm -hmm. that got me thinking other things because yeah. it's like, I think he was trying to, I think Checo was saying it's like, oh, oh yeah, no, me and Max are next to each other now because the cars are equal or like he finally has an equal car to Max or something like that. Or that mm -hmm. maybe they did give Max a better car and now he's in my car or something like that. Who knows? But that got me thinking like, okay, is Max, sandbagging on purpose to prove a point mm -hmm. you know because i don't know because you know like uh we talked about the the planet f1 article where he confirmed the theory that maybe max extended that gap that 22 second win last weekend so that to send a message to the team like listen the gap is going to get bigger yeah. you know the they are going to beat us if you don't fix the car i think with max the 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 confirmation on that was like it was the last couple of laps, whereas the mm -hmm. I can't remember who yeah. said it, but basically the, the guy was like, oh, yeah, he, you know, he intentionally backed off for a while to to show that gap. Yeah. And I think I it think, was already a 15 second gap when they're yeah. when he said like, oh, yeah, I knew but like I was never going to catch him, but I made yeah. it worse. <laughs> yeah. So and I do think that there's that. But I think the thing with Max is I don't believe it's in his DNA to lose on purpose. I think with him. If he thought he could win, he would keep winning. And I think the mm -hmm. problem is, like, when you watch some of his his uh, press post quality, he really was like, "I'm doing, I'm doing the best that I can, and there's nothing else I can do." And you can see just like this visible frustration on mm -hmm. his face. And I think, I think he is the type of winner who doesn't care how people feel about him, does not care mm -hmm. how the team feels about him. He I loves mean, winning. He and his that's special all, interest that's, is yeah. winning. Literally. And like, I think when he's losing, he's like, I, I, I just, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to say? I lost. I'm upset. Like, that's the answer. Yeah. There's no, there's no secret sauce. There's yeah. no press spin. I hate yeah. it here. Like, yeah. And no, <laughs> him in Dutch is very funny. Someone's like, why is he funnier in Dutch? Like, cause he's already, <laughs> I find him hilarious. I think Max is great. I, I love Mad Max. I want to see him just start playing bumper cars. Um, but in, in Max, he's like, what can I say? The car was shit. The track was shit. Strategy was shit. Which yeah. is all shit. Like it yeah. was like I hate it here. There's no there's no yeah. secret. Like yeah. um and so I think with him it's just like it, the car is falling apart. And 
it's so frustrating and their balance issues and he's doing the best that he can. But like you said, that radio that he gave and he was like, I understand this is a shit position, but can we maybe pay attention? Like I am still driving this car and we still have to finish this race. I think what's weird is that McLaren's not going, oh, well, all yeah. we have to do. And also the other thing about this sport is that tomorrow they could figure out what's wrong with the car and fix it. So you yeah. need to be catching as many possible points while they're down. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's one of those things where it's like, yeah, eventually they're going to they're gonna figure out what's out with the car. I don't like the idea that they're going backwards, though, to mm. try and get. And it's like, because even going backwards, it's like, these cars were not this bad. There's no way they were. What are we doing? Like, are we going 2019? What are we doing? I think it's a mix of things. I think they're trying to figure out what it was that broke the car. And so they're trying to strip things back from from different positions. But the other problem is that we're also moving to tracks that are suited to different types of of cars. Mm -hmm. So in trying to figure out what's wrong with this one and stripping back an upgrade to a different type of car, that upgrade that they had previously is probably not suited to a track like Monza or to mm -hmm. the next track. And I think they're calculatedly trying to figure out, okay, by which race, like the same way we see things where they do the math on the screen of like the uh, deficit between the two laps, they'll catch him. He should catch up in two to three laps. I think yeah. what they're looking at right now is they're saying, you know, with which changes, with, with what data, by X race, can we get the car back to winning form? Mm -hmm. And how many races can we afford to not be at top form in order to win the constructors? And so I think mm -hmm. that's what's happening from an engineering point of view. But it is really hard to watch because the part of you is like, just just go back to the exact build you had in the first race. Just yeah. put it back on the, on the track. Yeah, but like, the problem... How is it this bad? Well, the problem is, I think, I think the other problem is, even if they went back to the exact car that they started the season off with, everybody else has upgraded. So yeah. you're fighting against the fact that you went down and everybody else moved up. So even if you go back to your best, you're still behind McLaren. Um, you're still behind some of the changes that Ferrari and Mercedes have made. And mm -hmm. so I think that's the issue is like, it's a real, it's, it's just such a, personally, I would not want to be one of the engineers trying to figure this out because no, all that's yeah. happening is everyone's yelling at you and you're like, look. But uh, it, like, I think Max is going to go sit down there with like a cup of coffee and be like, I'm just going to watch, you know, like, I think that's next. You know, he's like, I can sim race here. It's fine. <laughs> I can, I can race for team Redline here. Um, because like, you know, it's, and then Max himself, it's like, oh, I've said everything I can. I've done all that I can. And it's like, yeah, I don't know what else to do here. And it's like, I know Adrian Newey is definitely probably going to Aston Martin. That's supposed to be announced in September. So that's any day now, probably maybe on this gap, you know, maybe. But then also on this gap, you know, maybe the car, they they figure everything out. They get some wind tunnel time and they figure out what the heck the car is wrong. You know, what's wrong with the car? And then by the time we get to, uh, you know, Baku, the, we, got, we got a Red Bull one too, you know, and then, you know, McLaren is shitting a brick, you know, yeah. who knows? Yeah, I think it's, you know, the whole thing about it is it's just you never know what's going to happen. And and when it comes to a giant math problem, which is what Formula One is, mm -hmm. once you figure out the problem that you are having in, in that, then it's still math. You just go right back to perfection. So yep. I don't know. Um, I will say I texted you this, too. I, I think mm -hmm. my bigger frustration with McLaren was how much focus it took away from Ferrari having such a great race of Charles having such yeah. a great race. And so yeah. I do want to make sure we talk about Charles because yes. I just, yes. uh, he had my favorite radio message of the weekend. I will say <laughs> because they said, okay, Norris, Norris P1. And he just said, I don't care. Right. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I do not care. That was during qualifying. Love it. And then I fully expected. So my prediction for this race was that uh, we were going to get first turn, uh, the McLaren's were going to take each other out, okay, because mm -hmm. uh, Lando was going to operate under the assumption that Oscar would bail out, and Oscar was not going to bail out, and these two collided, and then they were going to take up George with it, and we were going to get a Ferrari podium. I thought maybe Lewis might uh, get a, a slide in there, but, you know, I figured we were going to get a double Ferrari, sorry, McLaren, a double Ferrari podium in Monza, and I was like, I would love to see it. I think that would be interesting. Um, even though I'm a McLaren girl and, you know, I'm a Lando fan, I want this team to stop giving me anxiety. Um, <laughs> so I was like, the, the Tifosi can win this weekend. This will be fun. Um, and, uh, you know, I they they committed to the one stop, which I was worried about because everyone was saying that the one stop was probably not going to be working because it was 10 degrees hotter than it was all weekend. And it was already hot because every time they would cut to the crowd shots, there would be guys with their shirts off. 
in the crowd, like in the standing ovation. I was like, it's even hotter now. That's not good. Yeah. The one stop, everyone else committed to the two stop, the flipping Red Bull committed to a three stop, which was idiotic. I don't know what's going on there. Why did they start on hearts? And then they went on hearts again. I, anyways, okay. I need my team to be my team, but whatever. Anyways. <laughs> um, um, and so, but like, there were also a couple of messages as well, where Charles, it seemed like was arguing with the strategist again, which I think is what he needs to do because we know it's like, everyone was saying like, oh, the Ferrari strategy is working, but they also were trying to see if he wanted to come in a couple of times. And he was like, no, I can stay out. I can stay out. And he stayed out thankfully, but it's like, I don't want him battling his strategy the entire time as well. I, but I think, I guess some of what we've talked about today is like, mm. what makes you a better driver? What what makes you a good driver versus a great driver? And I think when you look at like what happened today with, mm. or well, what happened yesterday with Charles and you look at the way that he was talking to his strategist, right? There's like this one message where he says, they, they radio in again and he said, stop asking me this. If you ask yes. me something 10 times and I don't do it, it's not going to change. Yeah. Like I'm not going to do it. It's not going to get me to do it. Yeah. And so I yeah. was like, that's the thing is like the, the one thing I think drivers that you see with like great drivers is you can have all the data in the world. You can have all mm -hmm. the numbers in the world. You can't feel the car the way a driver yeah. can feel a car. And when you listen to Charles talk about it afterwards, he was like, you know, at a certain point, once they called Oscar in at that point, you don't go to a two stop because yeah. there's no way you're going to pass. So if you're going to take the risk, it, ironically, the same way that that George took the risk um, and mm -hmm. didn't pay off. But the shenanigans. Hey, um, but, when you, but when you look at it and you say, okay, now we actually have a chance of winning as long as we do not pit again. They pitted him too early as well, which you heard him complain about mm -hmm. over the radio. Yeah, because he's like, he was, why would we go when they were going for the undercut? Why yeah, would we, we were, when they we were, were already, already undercut. Under, undercut. Exactly. Why would we do that? Yeah. So it would have been an even, I think it would have been an even stronger win had they left him out longer um, and mm -hmm. then allowed him to, to have a longer stint on his first set of tires but mm -hmm. if you listen to him talk about it afterwards you you hear them say you hear him say like you know it worked because we got into the clean air i was able to change the balance onto the rear tires for a longer period of time mm -hmm. and to kind of give some release to that left um front that the everyone front was struggling that everyone with. else was struggling with yeah with the resurfacing with the angle exactly and so if you mm -hmm. look at what he talks about i don't know how many people realize that on the, the wheel of the car they're not just you know driving and doing what what they're supposed to do they can literally change like how much of the weight is on the back of the car how much of the weight is on the front of mm -hmm. the car like how the car is balanced and so when you're attacking you do need that weight on the front and that's why that left front tire is is a problem for everyone in this race because mm -hmm. that's the car that's where the car's taking the most damage but because of the way that charles was able to tell them no you have a position where he's able to say okay everybody's having trouble around this lap on the front left tire at mm -hmm. this lap now there's nobody in front of me and i have some clear space behind me i'm not in dirty air i can shift the balance to the back of mm -hmm. the car and he can sit, have those conversations and i'm sure yes the the pit wall and the strategists are involved in this conversation but mm -hmm. It's a conversation that he's forcing and he's telling yeah. them, no, I can win. I can do this if you let yeah. me do it this way. Let me do it my way. And so you look at that and it's like, I really, really, really do think if Ferrari can get their car together for 2026 with the new regs, you're going to see just such an incredibly dominant era between Charles and Lewis because both of them are willing to do that. Both of them are willing. And, and also, to be totally fair, Carlos is the same thing. Carlos is willing to tell them no. Carlos is willing to change strategy. So I think that's I think that is the big thing when you look at this this race is like Charles drove so incredibly well and mm. so incredibly smart. Like that was such a cerebral drive to be able yeah. to say, OK, this is what I need to do. And this is how I need to get myself to the finish line. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, again, you know, we, we move past Kimmy, but it's like, you know, that's Charles knowing the car, you know, mm -hmm. and knowing what the, it needed for that track, even though everyone was struggling on that track because it's a brand new service track and we had multiple people go off, especially at the Parabolica. No one expected the Parabolica to be that big of a problem mm -hmm. until the safety car went off. Everyone right. was expecting that first chicane to be the main issue. That was what everyone was like, oh, yay, new track. Isn't this look fun? And everyone was going <laughs> off of that one. And then the Parabolica is where people were going off track. I think Cola Pinto went off at one point. I was able to keep it out of the wall. Yes. But yeah. like, and that's where Kimmy went off and everything. And so to that's where, again, knowing the car, knowing what the car can do, knowing being comfortable to talk back to your strategist. No, I can do this, you know. 
and said you got Lando a couple of times. I don't think he did it this race, but there have been times where he's like, please don't talk to me right now. Like he just tells them to stop messaging him, stop radioing him when he's trying to focus on winning and things like that. You know, you've got like Max begging for data, but there's been also times where, you know, Charles has radioed and he's like, okay, give someone, tell me something. He's like, okay, someone's behind you. Tell me a number. What do you mean someone's behind me? Like (laughs) he is not against fighting back and being like, I need the data that I can use. This is your job to give me those numbers. I don't have that here. You need to give it to me. And I don't know if Lando can do that yet. Carlos can do it because Carlos knew he wasn't going to have a seat, you know, and now he's like, now I have to go to Williams. (laughs) Yeah. But (laughs) also I think, you know, you'll you'll see, I, I do think that is a mark of a driver that is, is, hungry for a win and I think yeah. we'll see Carlos try to do the same thing and I do think it will be that very was beneficial. That be my question is if you yeah. think he was going to try and get another win this year and join the uh, the two multiple wins in a season uh, club that seems to be very tight right now. So with, with Carlos I think one of the things that I really loved watching at this race is the fact that Carlos and Charles whether they like each other or not however Carlos feels about the fact that he's leaving mm-hmm. Ferrari the two of them do drive as teammates. And yeah. I think that they understand the, like they understand looking at it and saying, okay, this person's going to win. And um, both of Charles wins have been assisted by Carlos this year. Mm-hmm. So we had Monaco and we had um, Monza. And so I think when you look at it and you see Carlos willing to say, and and he gives the radio message, which is basically like, I'm going to do the best I can. My tires are shot, but I'll keep them behind me as long as yeah. I can. And he does. Yeah. He keeps Oscar behind. And I think that, when you look at how close it was, he did keep Oscar behind long enough. He did give a little bit more damage to Oscar's tires to keep him from catching mm. Charles. I think they're willing to drive for each other in that way as long as the other driver is is has earned that kind of spot. It's like it's Yeah. They they will battle early on in a race. They fully like that's there's been radio messages it's like I'm I'm racing my teammate. Like there's been complaints of that from both of them, I would say. But also I think we the the speculation at the start of the season, it's like yeah, why is Car- Carlos is going to be in his villain era? Because why would he listen to Ferrari when they just sold a seat to Lewis, basically? Or Lewis is taking a seat. Of course, he's going to be a goblin on track. And it's like, but when it comes down to it, he will support his teammate. And even when he won in Australia, uh, it was Australia. Yes, Australia. He said, you know, I get bring Charles to the line. I want us to celebrate this together. Exactly. You know? And they yes. celebrated this together as well. And he w- they were so excited. They ran off together, cuddling together when they were spraying <laughs> the champagne. They fled the champagne together. And to the point that everyone was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think with Carlos, it's like I would actually love to see him win one more time. And I think yeah. we could I think the best possible place if for McLaren that would be. If McLaren keeps bungling, I think they're gonna <laughs> we're gonna do a well, shit. and then Carlos yeah. is gonna like it's gonna be like a movie, like they're gonna go. <laughs> And the cross is going to zoom through because he went for the gap. You know, it's going to yeah. be, it's going to be, gonna be beautiful. Scene. I think the, cars. oh my God. Yeah. I think also the best possible <laughs> place for that to happen and the most likely place for that to happen would be Singapore. This is me manifesting mm-hmm. it right now. Um, yeah. I think that's where we would see it. And I, I honestly, I just, I think the thing that I really like and respect about the situation right now between Carlos and Charles is that they are still racing professionally. Like, it, they know that they're not mm-hmm. going to be together anymore. It's pretty much over. Carlos could just be a complete yeah, awful person if he wanted. He could have said, bring me in for my second stop. I'm not going to stay out here and try to do yeah. this. I need fresh tires. All these different things he could have done. But they did their best and they knew at a certain point and I also really love the way that he talked about the Monaco win where they asked him, they were like, you know, when you were doing qualifying, there was a possibility that you could have been there. Do you wish that you would have been on pole? And he was like, honestly, like, I just, I wanted, I wanted, Carl, I wanted Charles to win. It means a lot. Like, mm-hmm. and like you, you see those moments versus you don't see those moments at McLaren. And I think some of that is Fred. Like, I think Fred is, Fred Vassar is, is building the team that he wants that Ferrari has not mm-hmm. been in so long, which is... Mm-hmm. We are going to win as much as we can. We are going to do what needs to be done, even when it's hard. And mm-hmm. we're going to recognize that this is a team sport, but that sometimes someone is going to be a little bit more prioritized than others. Just like if Carlos was the one that was in front of that drive, they would have let Carlos win it. Like, And and I believe that Charles would have done the same thing that Carlos did. I think he would have sat there and you think he would have tried to, to move it. So you look at these different moments, you look at who can can build it, and you look at, honestly... Are they perfect strategy-wise? Obviously not. We had Charles literally battling with his race engineer, being like, absolutely not. Stop talking to me. Yeah. I hate you. Um, 
So like they're not in a perfect position, Doesn't right? Doesn't he have a new the, – didn't they swap out his strategist recently too? They Who did. was it? They, yes. they, yeah, and he's dealing <laughs> with this. What it's is like, going on with these tra- – the, what is going on with these pit walls? I think we need a pit wall like switcheroo and see sure. what happens. Like we need an overhaul of across the grid of pit walls um, because I don't know what's going on. Also, yeah. we didn't even talk about the race ban. For, for oh my god, I know. We, yeah. we like also. I did not know that it resets. And yeah. I, I, in my brain, my I was like, okay, he'll get the race ban, and then maybe it's like what to the next five. He can just be a goblin. He will just be yeah. a goblin. He, yeah, of so, all people, will go full <laughs> villain the rest for, of the season. <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know how race bans work, it's not each season; it's every twelve months rolling. So your penalty points stay for the next season. But given that Kevin Magnuson most likely will not be back mm-hmm. in Formula One next year, um, I fear for everyone for the rest yeah. of the, so, the so basically he had a collision with who was it first because it wasn't the first one it was like daniel daniel got the penalty the daniel first got penalty. the penalty yeah and then he collided with gasly and even watching it i was like was that came or gasly like i didn't at the yeah. first glimpse because it yeah. was just going so quickly and then also we didn't even talk about the 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 okay sorry um so k-mag collided with uh, Gasly, they ended up enforcing the penalty points after the fact, and there was a lot of speculation because they avoided giving him penalty points. Was mm-hmm. it for Monaco or Miami? It was Monaco because he had gotten the points in Miami that would have. He, yes, he had driven driven so recklessly in Miami and actually taken Logan out in yeah. such a bad way. Um, to the and point then that in, Logan did I do something wrong, which is a yeah. devastating radio message. Already to home Grand Prix where they did nothing for him. I'm still mad. I literally DM'd the Miami Grand Prix because I did uh, a little bit of PR for them, and I was like. Did you guys do nothing? Like, did I tell me I missed it? Tell me it was there and I didn't get to that section because your your track is laid out like a child drew it with a crayon and then you fed it into an AI. Like, tell me I just couldn't find it. Okay. No one replied. <laughs> but it's so he took, but he took Logan out. He should have gotten those, he got those points. And then he caused the crash with uh um Checo, which even Nico Hulkenberg was like, that was very unnecessary. And they didn't give him the points. And so the speculation was. You know, is the FIA afraid of dishing out those points that would lead to a race ban? Like, are they not going to enforce it? And then this led to the race ban, which was bad, but obviously both cars got to finish the race, unless I missed something. Yuki was out because of a gearbox issue, I believe. Yeah, Yuki's the only Um, one who didn't finish. Yeah. And so, which devastating because poor one out for Yuki Bears. Um, But, (laughs) um, but, you know, I was like the Checo crash I thought should have gotten it, but they decided against it. And then now they're doing the race band. So he's not going to be able to race in Baku. So they can put in another driver is my understanding. I think it would be really funny if they brought in Logan. I think it would be, I know they won't, but it would be really, really funny if they did. It would be so funny. Um, I think we'll <laughs> most likely see Ollie in that seat. I think it'll be an Ollie Bearman situation because I it know makes it'll sense. be Ollie, but yeah. I I really hope they invite Logan. I think they should bring Ollie and then invite Logan so there's speculation for 12 minutes. <laughs> I want there to be just to make James Vowles sweat. Tense. Yeah. I, it would be so funny. I, I would love it. Okay. So Haas, I'm giving you that for free. <laughs> American to American team. Bring him for one brace, then you can have an American racing on an American team for one Ooh, race. It would be so yeah. good, okay? And <laughs> I think it would be so funny. But if not, okay, so uh, then Ollie comes in, and then he just can't be there, right? He can't even be on site, is my understanding? My understanding is, yeah, he can't be. He gets basically the week off. He Because you you kind of go home and think about what you did type of situation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he posts from the beach. I hope it's him, <laughs> his kids. And his wife, and they're just chilling by the water while everyone's sweating in Baku. I think right. that'd be so funny. <laughs> and then you've got, uh, then he comes back and he gets a zero points. He gets to start from zero and he will just play bumper cars because that's will. what I would do. It sounds mean. I would do it. It's like, okay, I'm done, done my points. I get paid regardless of whether I finish the race or not. You know, yeah. it's. And to be I, honest, I, it's yeah. not like he has this like reputation of not doing that. So it's not like yeah. he's sullying his good name yeah. before he leaves. It's like, that's who he is. He might as well have fun. I do want to talk about George going off because this continues to be George's issue. Great qualifying, mm. bad drive. And I think mm. that is the same thing we saw here where it was just he drops off track, sustains front wing damage. Honestly, mm. truly thought he probably needed to pit for that. I'm surprised he did not get a penalty for driving yeah, with that amount of damage. Yeah, that was of that front wing bit was flopping and it's on yeah. camera, then falling off. I think it fell off off track is the only reason. Only I reason. Think. 
it yeah. flew off because it was a very small piece of the front wing that had that was just fiberglass, so it just caught, caught some air. Um, yeah. But that is that's something that Checo got fined for, you know, exactly. or got a penalty for was driving back to the pits when he should have just retired the car and they should have gotten yeah. the uh, the crane in there to get it out because it was yeah. spraying debris everywhere. Yeah. And especially on this track where the multiple times they had to, you know, get gravel off the track because there's gravel all over the track. It's, I don't know, I'm, I'm shocked. And then this thing with George, I don't know how to fix this with him either because then also he kept, he brought up the spa DSQ again. Like he's trying to go with this, uh, this, this, um, rhetoric that the reason he disqualified was because he didn't eat properly for the race um to the point where him and lewis were making jokes that they couldn't have any of the pasta and monza because they were both currently overweight and he's like oh yeah i didn't have that issue in spot like he brought it back up again and i was like no one is talking about that yeah leave <laughs> it like, alone <laughs> we move past that like and it's it's like so i i don't know what's going on with him on the car and again it's like Maybe there's other issues. Maybe he's stressing out. Maybe it's the, you know, jawline tick when Kimmy crashes. Maybe there's other things that he's just trying to mask and keep in time and that's coming out in the racing with him going off track. Um, this is something that I noticed as well uh, with Oscar as well, where this season specifically, um, he's kissing the gravel a lot, Oscar in particular. And I know a lot of them are because of the gravel traps and things like that. But Oscar in particular, it's like when he's doing well, without fail, he kisses the gravel at some point every time and it's something where i'm like okay we see the confidence but is he gonna respond to this and pull it back and george is obviously not there there's seems to be this ongoing issue with him yeah i think with george i think the i do think there's probably if we're starting to see signs of potentially him needing a new seat that it's far behind he's already been thinking about it um because he's actually in it so i do think that there's but a do position we think of that. that he but do we think it's an ego thing where he truly believes? Because, again, I don't he does know. believe he's better than Lewis. I think I, if you looked at his face during both Kimmy's free practice and the press conference where the two of them were there to announce Kimmy was officially part of the team, like, mm -hmm. there is a discomfort, I think, in his demeanor that isn't usually there um and it's okay. a discomfort that hasn't been present as lewis's teammate in a weird way like i think the reason why you wouldn't be threatened by lewis is that you think that lewis is pretty much ready re ready to retire and once he's gone i'm the most important and all of those different things and also he looks up to lewis like he's a big lewis fan when he was growing up like i think there are so many reasons why he doesn't feel threatened by lewis and obviously mm -hmm. lewis is leaving and so it doesn't matter anymore versus Kimmy is a real threat to his seat. And I think you can see yeah. that in his demeanor now um, because you see kind of like, it's totally fine. Don't worry about the crash. You see the way that Toto's talking about it. You see Toto saying in the press conference with the two of them, I knew Kimmy was the right fit five minutes after Lewis told me that he was retired, that he was leaving for Ferrari. Yeah. You, I think that's part of what's going on. But I will say, these are also the mistakes that George was making when he first moved over um, to, to yeah. Mercedes. So I don't know. I think it's it's... There is a level of like maybe it's him thinking he's not backing off or and that's where the issues come from. But I do think there's something that just we said this last week, but uh, George is consistently out qualifying Lewis, but Lewis is consistently out driving George. And I think that continues mm -hmm. to be the issue um, because you consistently see George qualify high and then fall far back and you see Lewis qualify mm -hmm. low and and move up the grid. So tragic, problematic, but he's doing his he and and I guess this is the problem. He may be doing his best, you know. So that's yeah. the issue. Do you think Toto will speak about him the same way James Bell spoke about Logan? That it's cruel to leave him in the Mercedes seat. No, I think Toto is smart enough to try to balance what he has until mm. he th he knows for sure he has something better. So all of mm. this Max conversation was happening while he could still say that there was a seat that was open for Max that yeah. he didn't have to worry about. I think had he gotten Max, the next time that as soon as George's contract was up, that seat was going to Kimmy. Um, I don't think he really, I think once he accepted he didn't actually have a shot at getting Max, then he goes back to, oh, these are my guys and they've always been my guys, right? And mm -hmm. so they'll always be his guys until he thinks he can get Max again and then that conversation will shift. Do we think there's like a prediction? Like, because like there's basically, they lay this out really weird where there's basically like a fall break in like two, like three weeks uh, yeah. and there's basically like another three week gap. Yeah. Uh, do we think that if the cars are not, like we don't see the whole overhaul in this next week. Like, do we think that after this next doubleheader that there's going to be, you know, 
another revamp revitalization of Aston Martin and Mercedes being like, you know, Max, you can come race whenever you want. You can come sim race. I think you want to sim race. You want to bring your cats to the paddock? We'll let you do that. <laughs> I think my feeling is that Max has made his decision to stay at Red Bull for now. And I mm -hmm. think it doesn't make sense for Max personally to move before 26, because even if the car is better next year, mm -hmm. it everybody has to start from fresh in 26 mm -hmm. and i think if he waits to see how everything like you know plays out who ends up where what teams are where it makes mm -hmm. more sense for him to stay somewhere that he knows how to handle everyone that everyone is willing to do exactly what he wants done and to continue to put up with his behavior like certain mm -hmm. teams are not going to deal with the way that he talks to their his race engineer and and those types of things i think mm -hmm. right now it does not make sense for Max logistically to leave because all you would be leaving for is to hopefully win one time next year. But you don't know for sure that you would because the only team that would make sense for Max to leave to for a win for next year would be McLaren. They're the only mm -hmm. team that has a car fully done. And obviously there's no space for him there. So I think, well, do we I think mean, that Lando might do a little kickball change over to <laughs> I, I, dances. Um, I think, uh, like, <laughs> I, think I, I, I think we I think we need another Lewis like move I think we need another like huge move that happens at one in the morning U.S. time LA time that I wake up from a dead sleep <laughs> to because I psychically knew it and I woke up and I was like what do you mean Lewis is going to Ferrari and then I was at an airport going on a cruise and it was confirmed and then yeah. two days later Christian Horner accusations, <laughs> bad things. It's like, oh my God. Like that was an insane <laughs> 72 hours that yeah. filled me so well. So okay? yeah, I think we need another one of that. I think we need, I think if, do we think that if Lando loses the world driver's championship this year, that there will leave. be a shift? Do we I, think there's a shift? I think it's possible, but I'm not sure that he would do it right now. I think he might stick mm -hmm. it out one more year with with McLaren and then wait to see again. I think it's because of the the new regulations that we don't know mm -hmm. where anyone's going. I think the only possibility that you're going to see open up is if Adrian Newey does confirm to go to Aston Martin and you've got, I mean, there's a possibility there that then Aston Martin could kick both their drivers off and take whoever they want on. So if you mm -hmm. get Adrian Newey and you have all the money in the world, which they do, um, mm -hmm. And then you say, hey, Max, Lando. They're getting the well, Honda engine. They're getting right? the Honda engine. Yeah. So I think like yeah. it, what's easy for them is if they get they get Adrian Newey, they get the Honda, Honda engine and they have the flexibility to tell Lance he's going to go do something else and that Fernando is going to move into like an advisory Let position. Let him go play tennis. Let, Let him, him do whatever he wants. So I think Aston has the biggest possibility for 26 to do something crazy. Like, I, to mm -hmm. do something really fun. And I think they could. I think they could get Max. I think they could get Lando. I think they could get whoever they want as long as they... Could Yuki? Yuki sweep? Yuki I would sweep love. Aston Martin? Would love. Would love. Don't know if it's going to happen, <laughs> but would love. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Actually, I'd love to see Max and Yuki be teammates in a really good way. I think they have a really good chemistry. I really think it would be... I think it would be interesting. But then also my whole thing with, like, when there was the shuffle of Checo and everything... I didn't want Daniel, mainly because I did not think Daniel was performing well, but I also felt like Daniel believed that he deserved the Red Bull seat. And so once he got it, I didn't, I thought he would become complacent and would not fight for it. I think yeah. Liam or Yuki would fight every single race to prove they deserved that seat. And yeah. that's what I thought would be better for them. And that's my whole case with that. But okay. Another possible tweak to my theory. Um, let's say Lando does not win World Drivers Championship, but somehow Oscar wins. <laughs> does that change? Does that change what you think Lando will do? Yeah, because I think they would literally have to take the engine out of Lando's car for Oscar. <laughs> <win>. <laughs> So if if someone takes all of the oil out of Lando's car for the rest of the season, I think he's going to leave. <laughs> They're like, hey, Lando, how do you feel about driving with two wheels this week? Does that feel good to you? Yeah. Hey, Lando, what if we just give you like a box? <laughs> like, like, how would what if that you Flin Could you Flintstone run this car to the finale? Yeah, I think yeah, it'd be yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. So no, I think. And I that's think, the um, thing is that the problem though is that my brain is like, I think Lando would try <laughs> like, to keep the team happy. <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, I think. I think so. Okay. Well, we already did all of our predictions which is nice it was a perfect segue yeah. I didn't have to segue us in but the last oh, I thing love I love yapping and predicting I, I know it. I love it the last thing I oh, do want to talk about oh I do want to say I I need Max to get a better car I need Red Bull to get together because it's costing me a lot of money oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> I need a call out post Max you Max Verstappen you in particular which I've gifted you a sub as well uh <laughs> because my chat thought it would be really funny to gift 
Uh, Because I say you won the Swell Grand Prix whenever someone subscribes. Mm. And so someone was like, oh, my God, if I won a a Grand Prix that Max Verstappen hasn't won. And so then my chat started gifting Team Redline, Max Verstappen, Lando Norris. Basically, all of the grid that has a Twitch account has been gifted a Swell Entertainment (laughs) sub, which is really fun. Um, But the rule that I set at the start of the season, because we started doing... uh, we do watch alongs for the races. Um, as I told my chat, I said, okay, the rule is we're going to set this rule is that if anyone, but Max wins a grand prix, I will gift 20 subs to chat. Okay. If you, if you come to the watch along, you will get 20 subs. And I said, even then I was a little cocky. I think it was before preseason testing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It may have been after I was like, it won't happen, (laughs) but if someone else wins, (laughs) you guys get 20 subs. Anyways, I am out a, a good chunk of money because yeah. I'm keeping to it. I said the season, I will commit to the season. I'm not one of these, you know, the, I don't flag on my bets. Okay, I commit. <laughs> so every time someone but Max wins and I am live, I am out $100. <laughs> I basically bet against myself and bet it. against the grid. And they are curb stomping me constantly. So this is why I don't gamble. <laughs> you you and the CEO of Formula E are just I know. out money. I know. Which I is crazy because, you know, the FIA, you know, F1 now owns a majority stake of Formula E. Um, okay. So the last thing I do want to talk about, though, is that so I have been talking about this with uh, with Max in particular, but. I want someone to attempt the Triple Crown. Fernando on the, is the mm-hmm. only person on the grid who's done it. Anyone who doesn't know what the Triple Crown is, it is Monaco, 24 Hour of Le Mans, and the Indy 500. And the Indy 500 mm-hmm. is the current sticking point for basically every driver on the grid who would go after the Triple Crown because people Why? are... I think it's because it's an oval. And so they're dangerous. They're scary. It's not what they're used to to racing. Um, it's, it's such a cool race, though. Like, I, I went to the Indy 500 during Monaco this year, and it yeah. was... And as someone who barely even understood IndyCar and how everything all works, like it was, they call it the greatest spectacle in racing. And then it is like, it's yeah. so cool. It's, it's so it's stressful. Very though. impressive. Yeah. yeah. It's very stressful. Yeah. So I think, I think the issue for most of them, because Max has basically said the same thing. I don't really want to do the Indy 500, but maybe. And then um, he obviously does want to do the 24 hours. I think mm-hmm. with um, Charles, it was cool to see him asked about it because he basically was like, I don't really have interest in the 500, but maybe. And but I definitely want to race the 24 hours. So my mm-hmm. my hope, I would love to see him try to do it. I just the Indy 500 is a completely different race, to be fair, to what yeah. they're used to racing. So it I think we'll do see him do the 24 hours took, first. Like, do you think if Fernando was like, I'm going to do it again? Like, do you think if it was that like the current grid would be more emboldened to do it if Fernando wanted to do it again? Maybe. I think so. Mm-hmm. I think I think if you if they watched someone else try it first basically (laughs) then they'd be like okay maybe um yeah i think i think they view the 24 hours as a much more like kind of elite type of race it's it's more it's european it's more similar to what they're used to growing up with and everything like that and it already has sort of this mark for it Mm -hmm. i think the fact i think the problem is that we see so much of formula one constantly talking about indy 500 as i mean talk constantly talking about in like it's a step indy car as a a step down is what they see yeah exactly so if you look at it because like that's what they're talking about with logan oh i think he'll you know he'll have a shot at indy car and it's like having a shot i think he'll do incredibly well in indy car i think daniel also would do incredibly well in indy car yeah you know i and i'm not just saying that because a lot of drivers that do okay in f1 do pretty good in indy car i mean Mm -hmm. that as i think that their driving styles and their demeanors are much more suited for IndyCar. That well, sounds and also, bitchy, but it's No, not. no, it's not. And I think that's the problem is that people don't realize that it's not someone being... I think because so many people are saying it in a bitchy context of like, mm-hmm. oh, well, he couldn't do it here, so maybe he'll do great in IndyCar. When you look at it, there are also drivers who did well in Formula One that that totally eat shit when they go to IndyCar. Look at yeah. Romain. I think I think what's frustrating about it is that like people don't recognize that when you're talking about the Triple Crown, the reason why Indy 500 is in there, you're talking about Monaco, Indy 500, and 24 Hours. The reason it's the Triple Crown is because those are all three completely different types of racing, and it's the pinnacle of that type of racing. So yeah. it's you know you're talking about endurance racing, you're talking about Formula One, and you're talking about um and uh the hardest oval, the the fastest oval, the oval the biggest spectacle in racing and so mm-hmm. you're looking at it and it's like there's there is a distaste from formula one down to indycar and i get it it's two totally different racing series but the mm-hmm. idea that indycar is such a step down that it's like t- spoken about as it's like kid racing that's how i feel i would love to see Charles do it i think i want to as much as we talked about 
as much as we talked about McLaren this this week in this episode mm-hmm. because there was so much to talk about, I really want to yeah. give Charlotte his props because I think it was a nice thing to watch. It was impressive and it was it was just such a great drive. The selfie he got where he apologized to the Sky Sports crew to because he left the podium and then came back. He was like, wait, sorry. And yeah. then came back with it to get a selfie with the massive crowd. Yeah. Like it's like the king of Monza, the prince of Monaco. Like it's that's a really cool thing. And yeah. I'm I'm glad he won. I really am. Me too. Um, yeah. Well, speaking of uh, anybody listening, if you want Charles to win another race, please tell us which race it is because I'll have Amanda back on to yes. do her witchcraft. So we'll schedule her in. Everybody pick one race. <laughs> 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 and that's the one that yes. we'll be manifesting. Um, yes. But as always, it was a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. Always, if you don't want to watch these races alone, you can join the actual grid chat. I host a group chat of motorsports fans where fan behavior is encouraged and there's no such thing as a stupid question. We watch these races live together, chat about breaking news, and of course, send each other an unhealthy amount of memes. If you'd like to join the grid chat, you can do so at tandemproductions.com slash grid chat. There will also be a link to that in the episode description. Once you fill out the form on the webpage there, you'll get an invite via email from me. If you want to connect, let me know what you thought about the episode or even just ask me another question that you'd like me to cover on the show, you can find me on all social media platforms at Marissa Kamari. And one of the best ways to connect with me is if you're listening to this podcast on Herd FM. You can find me in the community section on Herd FM, where my username is just my first name, Marissa. And once we follow each other, after every episode that you listen to, I'll be able to comment and have a conversation with you directly. So again, my username on Herd FM is Marissa. As always, I've been your host, Marissa Tandon, and thank you for joining the grid chat.